Female genital mutilation FGM, also known as female genital cutting and female circumcision, is the ritual cutting or removal of some or all of the external female genitalia. The practice is found in Africa, Asia and the Middle East, and within communities from countries in which FGM is common. UNICEF estimated in 2016 that 200 million women living today in 30 countries, 27 African countries, Indonesia, Iraqi Kurdistan and Yemen, have undergone the procedures, typically carried out by a traditional circumciser using a blade. FGM is conducted from days after birth to puberty and beyond. In half the countries for which national figures are available, most girls are cut before the age of five. Procedures differ according to the country or ethnic group. They include removal of the clitoral hood and clitoral glands, removal of the inner labia, and removal of the inner and outer labia and closure of the vulva. In this last procedure, known as infibulation, a small hole is left for the passage of urine and menstrual fluid, the vagina is opened for intercourse and opened further for childbirth, the practice is rooted in gender inequality, attempts to control women's sexuality, and ideas about purity, modesty and beauty. It is usually initiated and carried out by women, who see it as a source of honor and fear that failing to have their daughters and granddaughters cut will expose the girls to social exclusion. Adverse health effects depend on the type of procedure, they can include recurrent infections, difficulty urinating and passing menstrual flow, chronic pain, the development of cysts, an inability to get pregnant, complications during childbirth, and fatal bleeding. There are no known health benefits. There have been international efforts since the 1970s to persuade practitioners to abandon FGM, and it has been outlawed or restricted in most of the countries in which it occurs, although the laws are poorly enforced. Since 2010 the United Nations has called upon healthcare providers to stop performing all forms of the procedure, including reinfibulation after childbirth and symbolic nicking of the clitoral hood. The opposition to the practice is not without its critics, particularly among anthropologists, who have raised difficult questions about cultural relativism and the universality of human rights. Terminology Until the 1980s FGM was widely known in English as female circumcision, implying an equivalence in severity with male circumcision. From 1929 the Kenya Missionary Council referred to it as the sexual mutilation of women, following the lead of Marion Scott Stevenson, a Church of Scotland missionary. References to the practice as mutilation increased throughout the 1970s. In 1975 Rose Oldfield Hayes, an American anthropologist, used the term female genital mutilation in the title of a paper in American Ethnologist, and four years later Fran Hoskin, an Austrian-American feminist writer, called it mutilation in her influential The Hoskin Report, Genital and Sexual Mutilation of Females. The Inter-African Committee on Traditional Practices Affecting the Health of Women and Children began referring to it as female genital mutilation in 1990, and the World Health Organization who, followed suit in 1991. Other English terms include female genital cutting FGC, and female genital mutilation cutting FGM, C, preferred by those who work with practitioners. In countries where FGM is common, the practices many variants are reflected in dozens of terms, often alluding to purification. In the Bambara language, spoken mostly in Mali, it is known as balokali, washing your hands. And in the Igbo language in eastern Nigeria as Isa Aru or Iwu Aru, having your bath. Other terms include Kifad, Tahur, Quadin, Arua, Bondo, Karuna, Negakorsigan, and Kene Kene. A common Arabic term for purification has the root thr, used for male and female circumcision, Tahur and Tahara. It is also known in Arabic as Kavd or Kifad. Communities may refer to FGM as Faraunich for infibulation and sunna circumcision for everything else sunna means path or way in arabic and refers to the tradition of muhammad although none of the procedures are required within islam the term infibulation derives from fibula latin for clasp the ancient romans reportedly fastened clasps through the foreskins or labia of slaves to prevent sexual intercourse 
The surgical infibulation of women came to be known as Faraonich circumcision in Sudan, and as Sudanese circumcision in Egypt. In Somalia it is known simply as Kodab to sew up. <laughs> Methods The procedures are generally performed by a traditional circumciser cutter or excisers in the girls' homes, with or without anesthesia. The cutter is usually an older woman, but in communities where the male barber has assumed the role of health worker he will also perform FGM. When traditional cutters are involved, non-sterile devices are likely to be used, including knives, razors, scissors, glass, sharpened rocks and fingernails. According to a nurse in Uganda, quoted in 2007 in The Lancet, a cutter would use one knife on up to 30 girls at a time. Health professionals are often involved in Egypt, Kenya, Indonesia, and Sudan. In Egypt, 77% of FGM procedures, and in Indonesia, over 50%, were performed by medical professionals as of 2008 and 2016. Women in Egypt reported in 1995 that a local anesthetic had been used on their daughters in 60% of cases, a general anesthetic in 13%, and neither in 25% 2 were missing, don't know. Classification Variation The WHO, UNICEF and UNFPA issued a joint statement in 1997 defining FGM as, "...all procedures involving partial or total removal of the external female genitalia or other injury to the female genital organs whether for cultural or other non-therapeutic reasons." The procedures vary according to ethnicity and individual practitioners. During a 1998 survey in Niger, women responded with over 50 terms when asked what was done to them. Translation problems are compounded by the women's confusion over which type of FGM they experienced, or even whether they experienced it. Studies have suggested that survey responses are unreliable. A 2003 study in Ghana found that in 1995 4% said they had not undergone FGM, but in 2000 said they had, while 11% switched in the other direction. In Tanzania in 2005, 66% reported FGM, but a medical exam found that 73% had undergone it. In Sudan in 2006, a significant percentage of infibulated women and girls reported a less severe type. Topic. Types Standard questionnaires from United Nations bodies ask women whether they or their daughters have undergone the following, 1 cut, no flesh removed symbolic nicking, 2 cut, some flesh removed, 3 sewn closed, or 4 type not determined, unsure, doesn't know. The most common procedures fall within the cut, some flesh removed category and involve complete or partial removal of the clitoral glands. The World Health Organization a UN agency created a more detailed typology in 1997. Types I2 vary in how much tissue is removed. Type 3 is equivalent to the UNICEF category, sewn closed, and type 4 describes miscellaneous procedures, including symbolic nicking. Topic. Type 1 Type 1 is, "...partial or total removal of the clitoris and or the prepush." Type E involves removal of the clitoral hood only. This is rarely performed alone. The more common procedure is type IB, clitoridectomy, the complete or partial removal of the clitoral glands the visible tip of the clitoris and clitoral hood. The circumciser pulls the clitoral glands with her thumb and index finger and cuts it off. Topic. Type 2 Type 2 excision is the complete or partial removal of the inner labia, with or without removal of the clitoral glands and outer labia. 
Type IA is removal of the inner labia, type IIB, removal of the clitoral glands and inner labia, and type IIC, removal of the clitoral glands, inner and outer labia. Excision in French can refer to any form of FGM. Topic. Type 3 Type 3, infibulation or Fairounich circumcision, the sewn closed category, is the removal of the external genitalia and fusion of the wound. The inner and or outer labia are cut away, with or without removal of the clitoral glands. Type 3 is found largely in Northeast Africa, particularly Djibouti, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Somalia, and Sudan, although not in South Sudan. According to one 2008 estimate, over 8 million women in Africa are living with type 3 FGM. According to UNFPA in 2010, 20% of women with FGM have been infibulated. In Somalia, according to Edna Adan Ishmael, the child squats on a stool or mat while adults pull her legs open. A local anesthetic is applied if available. The element of speed and surprise is vital and the circumciser immediately grabs the clitoris by pinching it between her nails aiming to amputate it with a slash. The organ is then shown to the senior female relatives of the child who will decide whether the amount that has been removed is satisfactory or whether more is to be cut off. After the clitoris has been satisfactorily amputated, the circumciser can proceed with the total removal of the labia minora and the pairing of the inner walls of the labia majora. Since the entire skin on the inner walls of the labia majora has to be removed all the way down to the perineum, this becomes a messy business. By now, the child is screaming, struggling, and bleeding profusely, which makes it difficult for the circumciser to hold with bare fingers and nails the slippery skin and parts that are to be cut or sutured together. Having ensured that sufficient tissue has been removed to allow the desired fusion of the skin, the circumciser pulls together the opposite sides of the labia majora, ensuring that the raw edges where the skin has been removed are well approximated. The wound is now ready to be stitched or for thorns to be applied. If a needle and thread are being used, close tight sutures will be placed to ensure that a flap of skin covers the vulva and extends from the mons veneris to the perineum, and which, after the wound heals, will form a bridge of scar tissue that will totally occlude the vaginal introitus. The amputated parts might be placed in a pouch for the girl to wear. A single hole of 2 to 3 mm is left for the passage of urine and menstrual fluid. The vulva is closed with surgical thread, or agave or acacia thorns, and might be covered with a poultice of raw egg, herbs and sugar. To help the tissue bond, the girl's legs are tied together, often from hip to ankle. The bindings are usually loosened after a week and removed after 2 to 6 weeks. If the remaining hole is too large in the view of the girl's family, the procedure is repeated, the vagina is opened for sexual intercourse, for the first time either by a midwife with a knife or by the woman's husband with his penis. In some areas, including Somaliland, female relatives of the bride and groom might watch the opening of the vagina to check that the girl is a virgin. The woman is opened further for childbirth, defibrillation or deinfibulation, and closed again afterwards, reinfibulation. Reinfibulation can involve cutting the vagina again to restore the pinhole size of the first infibulation. This might be performed before marriage, and after childbirth, divorce and widowhood. Hani Lightfoot Klein interviewed hundreds of women and men in Sudan in the 1980s about sexual intercourse with type 3. The penetration of the bride's infibulation takes anywhere from three or four days to several months. Some men are unable to penetrate their wives at all, in my study over 15%, and the task is often accomplished by a midwife under conditions of great secrecy, since this reflects negatively on the man's potency. Some who are unable to penetrate their wives manage to get them pregnant in spite of the infibulation, and the woman's vaginal passage is then cut open to allow birth to take place. Those men who do manage to penetrate their wives do so often, or perhaps always, with the help of the little knife. This creates a tear which they gradually rip more and more until the opening is sufficient to admit the penis. Topic. Type 4 Type 4 is 
a ll other harmful procedures to the female genitalia for non-medical purposes including pricking piercing incising scraping and cauterization it includes nicking of the clitoris, symbolic circumcision, burning or scarring the genitals, and introducing substances into the vagina to tighten it. Labia stretching is also categorized as type 4. Common in southern and eastern Africa, the practice is supposed to enhance sexual pleasure for the man and add to the sense of a woman as a closed space. From the age of 8, girls are encouraged to stretch their inner labia using sticks and massage. Girls in Uganda are told they may have difficulty giving birth without stretched labia. A definition of FGM from the WHO in 1995 included gishiri cutting and anguya cutting, found in Nigeria and Niger. These were removed from the WHO's 2008 definition because of insufficient information about prevalence and consequences. Anguya cutting is excision of the hymen, usually performed seven days after birth. Gishiri cutting involves cutting the vagina's front or back wall with a blade or penknife, performed in response to infertility, obstructed labor and other conditions. In a study by Nigerian physician Myro Usman Mandara, over 30% of women with Gishiri cuts were found to have vesicovaginal fistulae holes that allow urine to seep into the vagina. Topic. Complications. Topic: Short-term and late. FGM harms women's physical and emotional health throughout their lives. It has no known health benefits. The short-term and late complications depend on the type of FGM, whether the practitioner has had medical training, and whether they used antibiotics and sterilized or single-use surgical instruments. In the case of type 3, other factors include how small a hole was left for the passage of urine and menstrual blood, whether surgical thread was used instead of agave or acacia thorns, and whether the procedure was performed more than once, for example, to close an opening regarded as too wide or reopen one too small. Common short-term complications include swelling, excessive bleeding, pain, urine retention, and healing problems, wound infection. A 2014 systematic review of 56 studies suggested that over 1 in 10 girls and women undergoing any form of FGM, including symbolic nicking of the clitoris, type 4, experience immediate complications, although the risks increased with type 3. The review also suggested that there was under-reporting. Other short-term complications include fatal bleeding, anemia, urinary infection, septicemia, tetanus, gangrene, necrotizing fasciitis, flesh-eating disease, and endometritis. It is not known how many girls and women die as a result of the practice, because complications may not be recognized or reported. The practitioner's use of shared instruments is thought to aid the transmission of hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and HIV, although no epidemiological studies have shown this. Late complications vary depending on the type of FGM. They include the formation of scars and keloids that lead to strictures and obstruction, epidermoid cysts that may become infected, and neuroma formation, growth of nerve tissue, involving nerves that supplied the clitoris. An infibulated girl may be left with an opening as small as 2 to 3 mm, which can cause prolonged, drop-by-drop -drop urination, pain while urinating, and a feeling of needing to urinate all the time. Urine may collect underneath the scar, leaving the area under the skin constantly wet, which can lead to infection and the formation of small stones. The opening is larger in women who are sexually active or have given birth by vaginal delivery, but the urethra opening may still be obstructed by scar tissue. Vesicovaginal or rectovaginal fistulae can develop holes that allow urine or feces to seep into the vagina. This and other damage to the urethra and bladder can lead to infections and incontinence, pain during sexual intercourse and infertility. Painful periods are common because of the obstruction to the menstrual flow, and blood can stagnate in the vagina and uterus. Complete obstruction of the vagina can result in hematocolpos and hematometra, where the vagina and uterus fill with menstrual blood. The swelling of the abdomen and lack of menstruation can resemble pregnancy. Asma El Dera, a Sudanese physician, reported in 1979 that a girl in Sudan with this condition was killed by her family.
Topic: Pregnancy, childbirth. FGM may place women at higher risk of problems during pregnancy and childbirth, which are more common with the more extensive FGM procedures. Infibulated women may try to make childbirth easier by eating less during pregnancy to reduce the baby's size. In women with vesicovaginal or rectovaginal fistulae, it is difficult to obtain clear urine samples as part of prenatal care, making the diagnosis of conditions such as preeclampsia harder. Cervical evaluation during labor may be impeded and labor prolonged or obstructed. Third-degree laceration, tears, anal sphincter damage and emergency caesarean section are more common in infibulated women. Neonatal mortality is increased. The WHO estimated in 2006 that an additional 10 to 20 babies die per 1,000 deliveries as a result of FGM. The estimate was based on a study conducted on 28,393 women attending delivery wards at 28 obstetric centers in Burkina Faso, Ghana, Kenya, Nigeria, Senegal and Sudan. In those settings all types of FGM were found to pose an increased risk of death to the baby, 15% higher for type 1, 32% for type 2, and 55% for type 3. The reasons for this were unclear, but may be connected to genital and urinary tract infections and the presence of scar tissue. According to the study, FGM was associated with an increased risk to the mother of damage to the perineum and excessive blood loss, as well as a need to resuscitate the baby, and stillbirth, perhaps because of a long second stage of labor. Topic. Psychological effects, sexual function According to a 2015 systematic review there is little high-quality information available on the psychological effects of FGM. Several small studies have concluded that women with FGM suffer from anxiety, depression and post-traumatic stress disorder. Feelings of shame and betrayal can develop when women leave the culture that practices FGM and learn that their condition is not the norm, but within the practicing culture they may view their FGM with pride, because for them it signifies beauty, respect for tradition, chastity and hygiene. Studies on sexual function have also been small. A 2013 meta-analysis of 15 studies involving 12,671 women from seven countries concluded that women with FGM were twice as likely to report no sexual desire and 52% more likely to report dyspareunia painful sexual intercourse. One third reported reduced sexual feelings. Topic. Distribution. Topic. Household surveys Aid agencies define the prevalence of FGM as the percentage of the 15 to 49 age group that has experienced it. These figures are based on nationally representative household surveys known as Demographic and Health Surveys DHS, developed by Macro International and funded mainly by the United States Agency for International Development USAID, and Multiple Indicator Cluster Surveys MICS, conducted with financial and technical help from UNICEF. These surveys have been carried out in Africa, Asia, Latin America and elsewhere roughly every five years, since 1984 and 1995 respectively. The first to ask about FGM was the 1989-1990 DHS in northern Sudan. The first publication to estimate FGM prevalence based on DHS data in seven countries was written by Dara Carr of Macro International in 1997. Topic: <laughs> Type of FGM Questions the women are asked during the surveys include, Was the genital area just nicked, cut without removing any flesh? Was any flesh or something removed from the genital area? Was your genital area sewn? Most women report, Cut, some flesh removed. Types I and II, type I is the most common form in Egypt, and in the southern parts of Nigeria. Type 3 infibulation is concentrated in northeastern Africa, particularly Djibouti, Eritrea, Somalia and Sudan. 
In surveys in 2002–2006, 30% of cut girls in Djibouti, 38% in Eritrea, and 63% in Somalia had experienced type 3. There is also a high prevalence of infibulation among girls in Niger and Senegal, and in 2013 it was estimated that in Nigeria 3% of the 0-14 age group had been infibulated. The type of procedure is often linked to ethnicity. In Eritrea, for example, a survey in 2002 found that all Hedereb girls had been infibulated, compared with 2% of the Tigrinya, most of whom fell into the cut, no flesh removed category. Topic. Prevalence FGM is mostly found in what Jerry Mackey called an intriguingly contiguous zone in Africa east to west from Somalia to Senegal, and north to south from Egypt to Tanzania. Nationally representative figures are available for 27 countries in Africa, as well as Indonesia, Iraqi Kurdistan, and Yemen. Over 200 million women and girls are thought to be living with FGM in those 30 countries. The highest concentrations among the 15 to 49 age group are in Somalia, 98%, Guinea, 97%, Djibouti, 93%, Egypt, 91%, and Sierra Leone, 90%. As of 2013, 27.2 million women had undergone FGM in Egypt, 23.8 million in Ethiopia, and 19.9 million in Nigeria. There is a high concentration in Indonesia, where according to UNICEF type 1 clitoridectomy and type 4 symbolic nicking are practiced. The Indonesian Ministry of Health and Indonesian Alema Council both say the clitoris should not be cut. The prevalence rate for the 0 to 11 group in Indonesia is 49%, 13.4 million. Smaller studies or anecdotal reports suggest that FGM is also practiced in Colombia, Jordan, Oman, Saudi Arabia and parts of Malaysia, in the United Arab Emirates, and in India by the Dawoodi Bora. It is found within immigrant communities around the world. Prevalence figures for the 15 to 19 age group and younger show a downward trend. For example, Burkina Faso fell from 89% 1980 to 58% 2010, Egypt from 97% 1985 to 70% 2015, and Kenya from 41% 1984 to 11% 2014. Beginning in 2010, household surveys asked women about the FGM status of all their living daughters. The highest concentrations among girls aged 0 to 14 were in Gambia 56%, Mauritania 54%, Indonesia 49% for 0 to 11 and Guinea 46%. The figures suggest that a girl was one third less likely in 2014 to undergo FGM than she was 30 years ago. According to a 2018 study published in BMJ Global Health, the prevalence within the 0 to 14 year old group fell in East Africa from 71.4% in 1995 to 8% in 2016, in North Africa from 57.7% in 1990 to 14.1% in 2015, and in West Africa from 73.6% in 1996 to 25.4% in 2017. If the current rate of decline continues, the number of girls cut will nevertheless continue to rise because of population growth. According to UNICEF in 2014, they estimate that the figure will increase from 3.6 million a year in 2013 to 4.1 million in 2050. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Rural areas, wealth, education. Surveys have found FGM to be more common in rural areas, less common in most countries among girls from the wealthiest homes, and except in Sudan and Somalia, less common in girls whose mothers had access to primary or secondary, higher education. In Somalia and Sudan the situation was reversed, in Somalia the mother's access to secondary, higher education was accompanied by a rise in prevalence of FGM in their daughters, and in Sudan access to any education was accompanied by a rise. <laughs> Age, ethnicity FGM is not invariably a rite of passage between childhood and adulthood, but is often performed on much younger children. 
Girls are most commonly cut shortly after birth to age 15. In half the countries for which national figures were available in 2000–2010, most girls had been cut by age 5. Over 80% of those cut are cut before the age of 5 in Nigeria, Mali, Eritrea, Ghana and Mauritania. The 1997 Demographic and Health Survey in Yemen found that 76% of girls had been cut within two weeks of birth. The percentage is reversed in Somalia, Egypt, Chad and the Central African Republic, where over 80% of those cut are cut between 5 and 14. Just as the type of FGM is often linked to ethnicity, so is the mean age. In Kenya, for example, the Kisi cut around age 10 and the Kamba at 16, a country's national prevalence often reflects a high sub-national prevalence among certain ethnicities, rather than a widespread practice. In Iraq, for example, FGM is found mostly among the Kurds in Erbil 58% prevalence within age group 15 to 49, as of 2011, Sulaymaniyah 54% and Kirkuk 20%, giving the country a national prevalence of 8%. The practice is sometimes an ethnic marker, but it may differ along national lines. For example, in the northeastern regions of Ethiopia and Kenya, which share a border with Somalia, the Somali people practice FGM at around the same rate as they do in Somalia. But in Guinea all Fulani women responding to a survey in 2012 said they had experienced FGM, against 12% of the Fulani in Chad, while in Nigeria the Fulani are the only large ethnic group in the country not to practice it. Topic Reasons Topic Support from Women Dahabo Musa, a Somali woman, described infibulation in a nineteen eighty eight poem as the three feminine sorrows. The procedure itself, the wedding night when the woman is cut open, then childbirth when she is cut again. Despite the evident suffering, it is women who organize all forms of FGM. Anthropologist Rose Oldfield Hayes wrote in 1975 that educated Sudanese men who did not want their daughters to be infibulated, preferring clitoridectomy, would find the girls had been sewn up after the grandmothers arranged a visit to relatives. Jerry Mackey has compared the practice to footbinding. Like FGM, footbinding was carried out on young girls, nearly universal where practiced, tied to ideas about honor, chastity and appropriate marriage, and supported and transmitted by women. FGM practitioners see the procedures as marking not only ethnic boundaries but also gender difference. According to this view, male circumcision defeminizes men while FGM demasculinizes women. Fuambai Amadu, an anthropologist and member of the Kono people of Sierra Leone, who in 1992 underwent clitoridectomy as an adult during a Sande society initiation, argued in 2000 that it is a male-centered assumption that the clitoris is important to female sexuality. African female symbolism revolves instead around the concept of the womb. Infibulation draws on that idea of enclosure and fertility. G. Genital cutting completes the social definition of a child's sex by eliminating external traces of androgyny. Janice Body wrote in 2007, The female body is then covered, closed, and its productive blood bound within, the male body is unveiled, opened, and exposed. In communities where infibulation is common, there is a preference for women's genitals to be smooth, dry and without odor, and both women and men may find the natural vulva repulsive. Some men seem to enjoy the effort of penetrating an infibulation. The local preference for dry sex causes women to introduce substances into the vagina to reduce lubrication, including leaves, tree bark, toothpaste and Vicks menthol rub. The WHO includes this practice within type 4 FGM, because the added friction during intercourse can cause lacerations and increase the risk of infection. Because of the smooth appearance of an infibulated vulva, there is also a belief that infibulation increases hygiene. Common reasons for FGM cited by women in surveys are social acceptance, religion, hygiene, preservation of virginity, marriageability, and enhancement of male sexual pleasure. 
In a study in Northern Sudan, published in 1983, only 17.4% of women opposed FGM 558 out of 3,210, and most preferred excision and infibulation over clitoridectomy. Attitudes are changing slowly. In Sudan in 2010, 42% of women who had heard of FGM said the practice should continue. In several surveys since 2006, over 50% of women in Mali, Guinea, Sierra Leone, Somalia, Gambia, and Egypt supported FGM's continuance, while elsewhere in Africa, Iraq, and Yemen most said it should end, although in several countries only by a narrow margin. Topic. Social obligation, poor access to information Against the argument that women willingly choose FGM for their daughters, UNICEF calls the practice a self-enforcing social convention, to which families feel they must conform to avoid uncut daughters facing social exclusion. Ellen Gruenbaum reported that, in Sudan in the 1970s, cut girls from an Arab ethnic group would mock uncut Zabama girls with ya, galva, hey, unclean. The Zabama girls would respond ya, mutmura. A mutmura was a storage pit for grain that was continually opened and closed, like an infibulated woman, but despite throwing the insult back, the Zabama girls would ask their mothers, what's the matter, don't we have razor blades like the Arabs? Because of poor access to information, and because circumcisers downplay the causal connection, women may not associate the health consequences with the procedure. Lala Balde, president of a women's association in Medina Cherif, a village in Senegal, told Mackey in 1998 that when girls fell ill or died, it was attributed to evil spirits. When informed of the causal relationship between FGM and ill health, Mackey wrote, the women broke down and wept. He argued that surveys taken before and after this sharing of information would show very different levels of support for FGM. The American nonprofit group Tostin, founded by Molly Melching in 1991, introduced community empowerment programs in several countries that focus on local democracy, literacy, and education about healthcare, giving women the tools to make their own decisions. In 1997, using the Tostan program, Malakonda Bambara in Senegal became the first village to abandon FGM. By August 2019, 8,800 communities in eight countries had pledged to abandon FGM and child marriage. Topic. Religion Surveys have shown a widespread belief, particularly in Mali, Mauritania, Guinea and Egypt, that FGM is a religious requirement. Gruenbaum has argued that practitioners may not distinguish between religion, tradition, and chastity, making it difficult to interpret the data. FGM's origins in northeastern Africa are pre-Islamic, but the practice became associated with Islam because of that religion's focus on female chastity and seclusion. According to a 2013 UNICEF report, in 18 African countries at least 10% of Muslim females had experienced FGM, and in 13 of those countries, the figure rose to 50-99%. There is no mention of the practice in the Quran. It is praised in a few da'if hadith sayings attributed to Muhammad as noble but not required, although it is regarded as obligatory by the Shafi'i version of Sunni Islam. In 2007 the Al-Azhar Supreme Council of Islamic Research in Cairo ruled that FGM had no basis in core Islamic law or any of its partial provisions. There is no mention of FGM in the Bible. Christian missionaries in Africa were among the first to object to FGM, but Christian communities in Africa do practice it. In 2013 UNICEF identified 19 African countries in which at least 10% of Christian women and girls aged 15 to 49 had undergone FGM. In Niger, 55% of Christian women and girls had experienced it, compared with 2% of their Muslim counterparts. The only Jewish group known to have practiced it are the Beta Israel of Ethiopia. Judaism requires male circumcision but does not allow FGM. FGM is also practiced by animist groups, particularly in Guinea and Mali. Topic: History. Topic: 
Topic: Antiquity. The practice's origins are unknown. Jerry Mackey has suggested that, because FGM's east-west-north-south distribution in Africa meets in Sudan, infibulation may have begun there with the Meroit civilization c. 800 BCE, c. 350 CE, before the rise of Islam, to increase confidence in paternity. According to historian Mary Knight, spell 1117, c. 1991–1786 BCE of the ancient Egyptian coffin texts may refer in hieroglyphs to an uncircumcised girl, Emt. The spell was found on the sarcophagus of Sit Hegotep, now in the Egyptian Museum, and dates to Egypt's Middle Kingdom. Paul F. O'Rourke argues that Emt probably refers instead to a menstruating woman. The proposed circumcision of an Egyptian girl, Tathamus, is also mentioned on a Greek papyrus, from 163 BCE, in the British Museum. Sometime after this, Nephorus Tathamus's mother, defrauded me, being anxious that it was time for Tathamus to be circumcised, as is the custom among the Egyptians. The examination of mummies has shown no evidence of FGM. Citing the Australian pathologist Grafton Elliot Smith, who examined hundreds of mummies in the early 20th century, Knight writes that the genital area may resemble type 3 because during mummification the skin of the outer labia was pulled toward the anus to cover the pudendal cleft, possibly to prevent sexual violation. It was similarly not possible to determine whether types I or II had been performed, because soft tissues had deteriorated or been removed by the embalmers. The Greek geographer Strabo, c. 64 BCE, c. 23 CE, wrote about FGM after visiting Egypt around 25 BCE. This is one of the customs most zealously pursued by them, the Egyptians, to raise every child that is born and to circumcise peritemán, the males and excise ectemán, the females. Philo of Alexandria, c. 20 BCE to 50 CE, also made reference to it. The Egyptians, by the custom of their country, circumcise the marriageable youth and maid in the fourteenth year of their age, when the male begins to get seed, and the female to have a menstrual flow. It is mentioned briefly in a work attributed to the Greek physician Galen, 129 c. 200 CE. When the clitoris sticks out to a great extent in their young women, Egyptians consider it appropriate to cut it out. Another Greek physician, Aetius of Amida, mid 5th to mid 6th century CE, offered more detail in Book 16 of his 16 books on medicine, citing the physician Philomenes. The procedure was performed in case the clitoris, or nympha, grew too large or triggered sexual desire when rubbing against clothing. On this account, it seemed proper to the Egyptians to remove it before it became greatly enlarged. Aetius wrote especially at that time when the girls were about to be married. The surgery is performed in this way, have the girl sit on a chair while a muscled young man standing behind her places his arms below the girl's thighs. Have him separate and steady her legs and whole body. Standing in front and taking hold of the clitoris with a broad mouthed forceps in his left hand, the surgeon stretches it outward, while with the right hand, he cuts it off at the point next to the pincers of the forceps. It is proper to let a length remain from that cut off, about the size of the membrane that's between the nostrils, so as to take away the excess material only, as I have said, the part to be removed is at that point just above the pincers of the forceps. Because the clitoris is a skin-like structure and stretches out excessively, do not cut off too much, as a urinary fistula may result from cutting such large growths too deeply. The genital area was then cleaned with a sponge, frankincense powder and wine or cold water, and wrapped in linen bandages dipped in vinegar, until the seventh day when calamine, rose petals, date pits, or a genital powder made from baked clay might be applied. Whatever the practice's origins, infibulation became linked to slavery. Mackey cites the Portuguese missionary João dos Santos, who in 1609 wrote of a group near Mogadishu who had a custom to sew up their females, especially their slaves being young to make them unable for conception, which makes these slaves sell dearer, both for their chastity, and for better confidence which their masters put in them." Thus, Mackey argues, a "...practice associated with shameful female slavery came to stand for honor." 
Topic Europe and the United States Gynecologists in 19th century Europe and the United States removed the clitoris to treat insanity and masturbation. A British doctor, Robert Thomas, suggested clitoridectomy as a cure for nymphomania in 1813. In 1825 The Lancet described a clitoridectomy performed in 1822 in Berlin by Karl Ferdinand von Graefe on a 15-year-old girl who was masturbating excessively. Isaac Baker Brown, an English gynaecologist, president of the Medical Society of London and co-founder in 1845 of St. Mary's Hospital, believed that masturbation, or unnatural irritation of the clitoris, caused hysteria, spinal irritation, fits, idiocy, mania and death. He therefore set to work to remove the clitoris whenever he had the opportunity of doing so, according to his obituary. Brown performed several clitoridectomies between 1859 and 1866. In the United States, J. Marion Sims followed Brown's work and in 1862 slit the neck of a woman's uterus and amputated her clitoris, for the relief of the nervous or hysterical condition as recommended by Baker Brown. When Brown published his views in On the Curability of Certain Forms of Insanity, Epilepsy, Catalepsy, and Hysteria in Females 1866, doctors in London accused him of quackery and expelled him from the obstetrical society. Later in the 19th century, A. J. Bloch, a surgeon in New Orleans, removed the clitoris of a two-year-old girl who was reportedly masturbating. According to a 1985 paper in the Obstetrical and Gynecological Survey, clitoridectomy was performed in the United States into the 1960s to treat hysteria, erotomania and lesbianism. From the mid-1950s, James C. Burt, a gynecologist in Dayton, Ohio, performed non-standard repairs of episiotomies after childbirth, adding more stitches to make the vaginal opening smaller. From 1966 until 1989, he performed love surgery by cutting women's pubococcygeus muscle, repositioning the vagina and urethra, and removing the clitoral hood, thereby making their genital area more appropriate, in his view, for intercourse in the missionary position. Women are structurally inadequate for intercourse, he wrote, he said he would turn them into horny little mice. In the 1960s and 1970s he performed these procedures without consent while repairing episiotomies and performing hysterectomies and other surgery, he said he had performed a variation of them on 4,000 women by 1975. Following complaints, he was required in 1989 to stop practicing medicine in the United States. Opposition. Topic. Colonial opposition in Kenya Protestant missionaries in British East Africa present-day Kenya began campaigning against FGM in the early 20th century, when Dr. John Arthur joined the Church of Scotland Mission CSM, in Kikuyu. An important ethnic marker, the practice was known by the Kikuyu, the country's main ethnic group, as a rua for both girls and boys. It involved excision, type 2, for girls and removal of the foreskin for boys. Unexcised Kikuyu women Arugu, were outcasts. Jomo Kenyatta, General Secretary of the Kikuyu Central Association and later Kenya's first Prime Minister, wrote in 1938 that, for the Kikuyu, the institution of FGM was the condition sine qua non of the whole teaching of tribal law, religion, and morality. No proper Kikuyu man or woman would marry or have sexual relations with someone who was not circumcised, he wrote. A woman's responsibilities toward the tribe began with her initiation. Her age and place within tribal history was traced to that day, and the group of girls with whom she was cut was named according to current events, an oral tradition that allowed the Kikuyu to track people and events going back hundreds of years. Beginning with the CSM in 1925, several missionary churches declared that FGM was prohibited for African Christians. The CSM announced that Africans practicing it would be excommunicated, which resulted in hundreds leaving or being expelled. In 1929, the Kenya Missionary Council began referring to FGM as the sexual mutilation of women. And a person's stance toward the practice became a test of loyalty, either to the Christian churches or to the Kikuyu Central Association. 
The standoff turned FGM into a focal point of the Kenyan independence movement. The 1929 to 1931 period is known in the country's historiography as the female circumcision controversy. When Hulda Stumpf, an American missionary who opposed FGM in the girls' school she helped to run, was murdered in 1930, Edward Grigg, the governor of Kenya, told the British colonial office that the killer had tried to circumcise her. There was some opposition from Kenyan women themselves. At the mission in Tumatumu, Karatina, where Marion Scott Stevenson worked, a group calling themselves NGO Yatuiritu, Shield of Young Girls, the membership of which included Raheli Warijia, mother of Gakara Wa Wanjao, wrote to the local native council of South Nyeri on 25 December 1931. W. E. of the NGO Yatuiritu heard that there are men who talk of female circumcision, and we get astonished because they, men, do not give birth and feel the pain and even some die and even others become infertile, and the main cause is circumcision. Because of that the issue of circumcision should not be forced. People are caught like sheep, one should be allowed to cut her own way of either agreeing to be circumcised or not without being dictated on one's own body. Elsewhere, support for the practice from women was strong. In 1956 in Meru, eastern Kenya, when the Council of Male Elders the Injuri Nsihek, announced a ban on FGM in 1956, thousands of girls cut each other's genitals with razor blades over the next three years as a symbol of defiance. The movement came to be known as Naitana, I will circumcise myself, because to avoid naming their friends the girls said they had cut themselves. Historian Lynn Thomas described the episode as significant in the history of FGM because it made clear that its victims were also its perpetrators. FGM was eventually outlawed in Kenya in 2001, although the practice continued, reportedly driven by older women. <laughs> <laughs> Growth of opposition One of the earliest campaigns against FGM began in Egypt in the 1920s, when the Egyptian Doctors' Society called for a ban. There was a parallel campaign in Sudan, run by religious leaders and British women. Infibulation was banned there in 1946, but the law was unpopular and barely enforced. The Egyptian government banned infibulation in state-run hospitals in 1959, but allowed partial clitoridectomy if parents requested it. Egypt banned FGM entirely in 2007. In 1959, the UN asked the WHO to investigate FGM, but the latter responded that it was not a medical matter. Feminists took up the issue throughout the 1970s. The Egyptian physician and feminist Nawal El Sadawi criticized FGM in her book Women and Sex, 1972. The book was banned in Egypt and El Sadawi lost her job as Director General of Public Health. She followed up with a chapter, The Circumcision of Girls, in her book The Hidden Face of Eve, Women in the Arab World, 1980, which described her own clitoridectomy when she was six years old. I did not know what they had cut off from my body, and I did not try to find out. I just wept, and called out to my mother for help. But the worst shock of all was when I looked around and found her standing by my side. Yes, it was her, I could not be mistaken, in flesh and blood, right in the midst of these strangers, talking to them and smiling at them, as though they had not participated in slaughtering her daughter just a few moments ago. In 1975, Rose Oldfield Hayes, an American social scientist, became the first female academic to publish a detailed account of FGM, aided by her ability to discuss it directly with women in Sudan. Her article in American Ethnologist called it female genital mutilation, rather than female circumcision, and brought it to wider academic attention. Edna Adan Ishmael, who worked at the time for the Somalia Ministry of Health, discussed the health consequences of FGM in 1977 with the Somali Women's Democratic Organization. Two years later Fran Hosken, an Austria-American feminist, published the Hosken Report, Genital and Sexual Mutilation of Females 1979, the first to offer global figures. She estimated that 110,529,000 women in 20 African countries had experienced FGM. The figures were speculative but consistent with later surveys. Describing FGM as a training ground for male violence. 
Hoskin accused female practitioners of "...participating in the destruction of their own kind." The language caused a rift between Western and African feminists. African women boycotted a session featuring Hoskin during the UN's mid decade conference on women in Copenhagen in July 1980. In 1979, the WHO held a seminar, Traditional Practices Affecting the Health of Women and Children, in Khartoum, Sudan, and in 1981, also in Khartoum, 150 academics and activists signed a pledge to fight FGM after a workshop held by the Babaka Badri Scientific Association for Women's Studies BBSAWS. Female circumcision mutilates and endangers women, combat it. Another BBSAWS workshop in 1984 invited the international community to write a joint statement for the United Nations. It recommended that the goal of all African women should be the eradication of FGM and that, to sever the link between FGM and religion, clitoridectomy should no longer be referred to as SUNA. The Inter African Committee on Traditional Practices Affecting the Health of Women and Children, founded in 1984 in Dhaka, Senegal, called for an end to the practice, as did the UN's World Conference on Human Rights in Vienna in 1993. The conference listed FGM as a form of violence against women, marking it as a human rights violation, rather than a medical issue. Throughout the 1990s and 2000s governments in Africa and the Middle East passed legislation banning or restricting FGM. In 2003 the African Union ratified the Maputo Protocol on the Rights of Women, which supported the elimination of FGM. By 2015 laws restricting FGM had been passed in at least 23 of the 27 African countries in which it is concentrated, although several fell short of a ban. <laughs> United Nations In December 1993, the United Nations General Assembly included FGM in Resolution 48-104, the Declaration on the Elimination of Violence Against Women, and from 2003 sponsored International Day of Zero Tolerance for Female Genital Mutilation, held every 6 February. UNICEF began in 2003 to promote an evidence-based social norms approach, using ideas from game theory about how communities reach decisions about FGM, and building on the work of Jerry Mackey on the demise of footbinding in China. In 2005 the UNICEF Innocenti Research Center in Florence published its first report on FGM. UNFPA and UNICEF launched a joint program in Africa in 2007 to reduce FGM by 40% within the 0 to 15 age group and eliminate it from at least one country by 2012, goals that were not met and which they later described as unrealistic. In 2008 several UN bodies recognized FGM as a human rights violation, and in 2010 the UN called upon healthcare providers to stop carrying out the procedures, including reinfibulation after childbirth and symbolic nicking. In 2012 the General Assembly passed Resolution 67146, intensifying global efforts for the elimination of female genital mutilations. Non-practicing countries <inaudible> Overview Immigration spread the practice to Australia, New Zealand, Europe and North America, all of which outlawed it entirely or restricted it to consenting adults. Sweden outlawed FGM in 1982 with the Act Prohibiting the Genital Mutilation of Women, the first Western country to do so. Several former colonial powers, including Belgium, Britain, France and the Netherlands, introduced new laws or made clear that it was covered by existing legislation. As of 2013 legislation banning FGM had been passed in 33 countries outside Africa and the Middle East. Topic. North America In the United States an estimated 513,000 women and girls had experienced FGM or were at risk as of 2012. 
A Nigerian woman successfully contested deportation in March 1994 on the grounds that her daughters might be cut, and in 1996 Fauzia Kasinga from Togo became the first to be granted asylum to escape FGM. In 1996 the Federal Prohibition of Female Genital Mutilation Act made it illegal to perform FGM on minors for non-medical reasons, and in 2013 the Transport for Female Genital Mutilation Act prohibited transporting a minor out of the country for the purpose of FGM. The first FGM conviction in the U.S. was in 2006, when Khalid Adam, who had emigrated from Ethiopia, was sentenced to 10 years for aggravated battery and cruelty to children after severing his two-year-old daughter's clitoris with a pair of scissors. A federal judge ruled in 2018 that the 1996 Act was unconstitutional, arguing that FGM is a "...local criminal activity." That should be regulated by states, not by Congress. He made his ruling during a case against members of the Dawoodi Bora community in Michigan accused of carrying out FGM. 24 states had legislation banning FGM as of 2016. The American Academy of Pediatrics opposes all forms of the practice, including pricking the clitoral skin. Canada recognized FGM as a form of persecution in July 1994, when it granted refugee status to Kadra Hassan Farah, who had fled Somalia to avoid her daughter being cut. In 1997, Section 268 of its Criminal Code was amended to ban FGM, except where the person is at least 18 years of age and there is no resulting bodily harm." As of July 2017 there had been no prosecutions. Canadian officials have expressed concern that a few thousand Canadian girls are at risk of "...vacation cutting," whereby girls are taken overseas to undergo the procedure, but as of 2017 there were no firm figures. Europe According to the European Parliament, 500,000 women in Europe had undergone FGM as of March 2009. France is known for its tough stance against FGM. Up to 30,000 women there were thought to have experienced it as of 1995. According to Colette Gallard, a family planning counsellor, when FGM was first encountered in France, the reaction was that Westerners ought not to intervene. It took the deaths of two girls in 1982, one of them three months old, for that attitude to change. In 1991 a French court ruled that the convention relating to the status of refugees offered protection to FGM victims. The decision followed an asylum application from Aminata Giop, who fled an FGM procedure in Mali. The practice is outlawed by several provisions of France's penal code that address bodily harm causing permanent mutilation or torture. All children under six who were born in France undergo medical examinations that include inspection of the genitals, and doctors are obliged to report FGM. The first civil suit was in 1982, and the first criminal prosecution in 1993. In 1999 a woman was given an eight-year sentence for having performed FGM on 48 girls. By 2014 over 100 parents and two practitioners had been prosecuted in over 40 criminal cases, around 137,000 women and girls living in England and Wales were born in countries where FGM is practiced, as of 2011. Performing FGM on children or adults was outlawed under the Prohibition of Female Circumcision Act 1985. This was replaced by the Female Genital Mutilation Act 2003 and Prohibition of Female Genital Mutilation Scotland Act 2005, which added a prohibition on arranging FGM outside the country for British citizens or permanent residents. The United Nations Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women asked the government in July 2013 to "...ensure the full implementation of its legislation on FGM." The first charges were brought in 2014 against a physician and another man. The physician had stitched an infibulated woman after opening her for childbirth. Both men were acquitted in 2015. Topic: Criticism of opposition. Topic: Tolerance versus human rights 
Anthropologists have accused FGM eradicationists of cultural colonialism, and have been criticized in turn for their moral relativism and failure to defend the idea of universal human rights. According to critics of the eradicationist position, the biological reductionism of the opposition to FGM, and the failure to appreciate FGM's cultural context, serves to other practitioners and undermine their agency in particular when parents are referred to as mutilators. Africans who object to the tone of FGM opposition risk appearing to defend the practice. The feminist theorist Obioma Nimeka, herself strongly opposed to FGM, argued in 2005 that renaming the practice female genital mutilation had introduced a subtext of barbaric African and Muslim cultures and the West's relevance even indispensability in purging it. According to Ugandan law professor Sylvia Tamali, the early Western opposition to FGM stemmed from a Judeo-Christian judgment that African sexual and family practices, including not only FGM but also dry sex, polygyny, bride price and leveret marriage, required correction. African feminists take strong exception to the imperialist, racist and dehumanizing infantilization of African women," she wrote in 2011. Commentators highlight the voyeurism in the treatment of women's bodies as exhibits. Examples include images of women's vulvas after FGM or girls undergoing the procedure. The 1996 Pulitzer Prize-winning photographs of a 16-year-old Kenyan girl experiencing FGM were published by 12 American newspapers, without her consent either to be photographed or to have the images published. The debate has highlighted a tension between anthropology and feminism, with the former's focus on tolerance and the latter's on equal rights for women. According to the anthropologist Christine Wally, a common position in anti-FGM literature has been to present African women as victims of false consciousness participating in their own oppression, a position promoted by feminists in the 1970s and 1980s, including Fran Hosken, Mary Daly and Hanny Lightfoot Klein. It prompted the French Association of Anthropologists to issue a statement in 1981, at the height of the early debates, that a certain feminism resuscitates today the moralistic arrogance of yesterday's colonialism. Topic: <laughs> Comparison with other procedures. Topic: <laughs> 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 Cosmetic procedures. Nimeka argues that the crucial question, broader than FGM, is why the female body is subjected to so much abuse and indignity, including in the West. Several authors have drawn a parallel between FGM and cosmetic procedures. Ronorn Conroy of the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland wrote in 2006 that cosmetic genital procedures were driving the advance of FGM by encouraging women to see natural variations as defects. Anthropologist Fadwa El Gindi compared FGM to breast enhancement, in which the maternal function of the breast becomes secondary to men's sexual pleasure. Benoit A. Grolt, the French feminist, made a similar point in 1975, citing FGM and cosmetic surgery as sexist and patriarchal. Against this, the medical anthropologist Carla Obermeyer argued in 1999 that FGM may be conducive to a subject's social well-being in the same way that rhinoplasty and male circumcision are. Despite the 2007 ban in Egypt, Egyptian women wanting FGM for their daughters seek amaliyat tajmil cosmetic surgery, to remove what they see as excess genital tissue. Cosmetic procedures such as labioplasty and clitoral hood reduction do fall within the WHO's definition of FGM, which aims to avoid loopholes, but the WHO notes that these elective practices are generally not regarded as FGM. Some legislation banning FGM, such as in Canada and the US, covers minors only, but several countries, including Sweden and the UK, have banned it regardless of consent. Sweden, for example, has banned operations on the outer female sexual organs with a view to mutilating them or bringing about some other permanent change in them, regardless of whether or not consent has been given for the operation. 
Gynecologist Birgitta Essain and anthropologist Sarah Johnsdotter argue that the law seems to distinguish between Western and African genitals, and deems only African women such as those seeking reinfibulation after childbirth unfit to make their own decisions. The philosopher Martha Nussbaum argues that a key concern with FGM is that it is mostly conducted on children using physical force. The distinction between social pressure and physical force is morally and legally salient, comparable to the distinction between seduction and rape. She argues further that the literacy of women in practicing countries is generally poorer than in developed nations, which reduces their ability to make informed choices. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Intersex children, male circumcision. Several commentators maintain that children's rights are violated not only by FGM but also by the genital alteration of intersex children, who are born with anomalies that physicians choose to correct. Arguments have been made that non-therapeutic male circumcision, practiced by Muslims, Jews and some Christian groups, also violates children's rights. Globally about 30% of males over 15 are circumcised, of these, about two-thirds are Muslim. An American Academy of Pediatrics Circumcision Task Force issued a policy statement in 2012 that the health benefits of male circumcision outweigh the risks. They recommended that it be carried out, if it is performed, by trained and competent practitioners using sterile techniques and effective pain management. The statement met with protests from a group of 38 doctors in Europe, who accused the task force of cultural bias. At least half the male population of the United States is circumcised, while most men in Europe are not. See also Child marriage Sources equals 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 notes <laughs> <laughs>